Last time, we learned about a digital device called the flip-flop and how they use a single signal called a clock to control the flow of data through them. This is the same clock speed idea that you have probably heard about with modern CPUs or processors that run at speeds in the megahertz or gigahertz. The D flip-flop provided us with a good example of how the clock can control the speed of a system. A delay flip-flop, as we learned last time, takes one clock cycle or period to transfer the data from input to its output. So if we had two D flip-flops connected in series like this, it would take two clock cycles or periods for the input data to reach the second D flip-flops output. If you took the previous course, an introduction to modern electronics, you learned about the 555 timer and how it can provide an A-stable output signal that transitions back and forth between logic 1 and logic 0. Well, this is exactly what a clock signal is and looks like. Because of that, a 555 timer can actually be used as the clock signal for driving D flip-flops or JK flip-flops or any flip-flops. Another type of clock signal that is commonly used in digital electronics comes from a small device like this called an oscillator. These devices use an internal crystal to vibrate at a certain speed, 20 megahertz for this oscillator, and that clock signal is output from the oscillator to be used in your circuit. If you're more familiar with RF or analog circuits, then you'll know that capacitors charge and discharge energy. Well, a third type of clock signal can be what is known as an RC oscillator, which uses a resistor and capacitor that charges and discharges to create a clock signal. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a clock signal to see what it is and what attributes it has. The clock signals we'll be using will change between 0 volts, which is logic 0, and 5 volts, which is logic 1, like the signal you see on your screen now. A good clock signal stays at logic 0 50% of the time and at logic 1 50% of the time. This is what is known as a clock signal with the 50% duty cycle. The attributes that you need to know about a digital clock signal are that the logic 0 time, negative duty cycle, and logic 1 time, positive duty cycle, added together give you the period of the clock signal, and 1 over the period gives you the frequency of the signal, frequency meaning how many times that period occurs in one second. To further cement in the idea of duty cycle, if the clock signal looked like this, where the positive duty cycle is 30% and negative duty cycle is 70%, we would refer to the signal as a 3070 duty cycle, since it's only on 30% of the time. And if we take a look back at the timing diagram for the D flip-flop, you can see the clock is the first thing on the diagram. This is typical for almost all timing diagrams since the clock signal dictates when the inputs will affect the outputs. Also, here's the JK flip-flop timing diagram. And again, we see the clock is the first line in the timing diagram. The 555 timer's A-stable output that we saw in the introduction to modern electronics course makes for a great clock for simple electronics like we want to build. So let's build up a 555 timer with A stable output and use it as a clock signal for going into a D flip-flop. Here's the schematic of the circuit we're going to build. The parts we'll need are the jumper wire kit, a breadboard, a nine volt battery, and from the components kit, five 10 kilo ohm resistors, four 100 ohm resistors, a 10 and 100 microfarad capacitor, four red LEDs, a push button, a 7805 five volt regulator, a nine volt battery connector, one 555 timer, one 74HC74 D flip-flop, and for later on, the crystal oscillator. To build the circuit, first we'll assemble the power supply. The 7805 goes into the breadboard 
and we connect the 9 volt battery connector's red wire to pin 1 and the black wire to pin 2. Next, we connect a yellow wire from the 7805's pin 2 to the ground bus of the breadboard and a green wire connects from the 7805's pin 3 to the power bus of the breadboard. At the bottom of the breadboard, we use two red wires to connect the power and ground buses together on the breadboard. Now, we place the 555 timer, 74HC74, and push button on the breadboard, and follow the schematic to wire them up. Now, power the circuit up, and you should see some blinking from our 555 timer clock. However, since the data at the D input is always logic zero, the output is also logic zero. But if we press the push button down, the logic one at the D input is now being clocked into the flip-flop each time the clock changes from logic zero to logic one. However, when we stop pressing the push button, the input at D is reconnected to ground through the 10 kilo ohm resistor and the output goes back to being logic zero. The 555 timer is running at a slow frequency, 0.5 hertz, which is incredibly slow. In fact, it is so slow that you can actually see the flip-flop delay before data is moved from the D input to the Q output. Let's swap our 100 microfarad capacitor for the 10 microfarad capacitor to make the clock move a little faster. And now the delay is much less. However, it is still a little noticeable. If we pull out the 555 timer circuit and insert this crystal oscillator to our breadboard, we'll get a much faster clock signal, something in the megahertz, so place the oscillator in the breadboard, connect power and ground to the oscillator, then connect the output of the oscillator to the D flip-flops clock input. I also added a 100 ohm resistor and LED off of the crystal's output to show you how fast it is oscillating. Now after you power up the system again, press the push button. The moment you press it, the data at the D input is seen at the Q output. This happens so quickly because when the clock runs at 10, 20, or 30 megahertz, that means that data is moving through the flip-flop every 100 nanoseconds or faster, which is much too fast for your eyes to notice. Clock signals are so common in the real world, you've been seeing them since you were born. Clocks are on walls everywhere. In refrigerators, you wear them on your wrist, and they're in your cell phone. Most of these clocks run at one hertz, one tick per second. But the clock signals inside of things like computers or cell phones will run much faster in the megahertz or gigahertz range because the clock is powering a processor that needs to make decisions and follow instructions. So for computers, the faster the clock speed, the better. While the 555 timer we used in this experiment is super slow at 0.5 hertz, and it might seem less than modern, we will continue to use it because it allows us to see the changes as they happen, meaning you can follow along with a timing diagram. That's compared to using a crystal oscillator that goes at light speed where our eyes have no chance of seeing any digital state changes. All parts in this online course were provided by the Gadgetory. Visit them at gadgetory.com slash pyroedu. Now that we understand how both clocks and flip-flops work, the real fun and designing can begin. Next time, we'll learn how to design and use a shift register.